What's up, everyone? Joining me today, I have Jeremy Wilfinger from After Reset Studios uh, to talk about their game, uh, After Reset. I'm sorry, Black Cloud Studios, to talk about After Reset. Um, how are you doing today, Jeremy? I'm doing great. How are you, Ben? I am great. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to sit with me and uh, talk about your game. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and just uh, let's jump straight into this. Uh, After Reset takes place in a post-apocalyptic world ravaged by a kind of nuclear fire and left in the ashes. Um, the lucky ones now live in these underground cities, um, you could call them. And uh, can, can you just explain the premise a little deeper for the listeners? Yeah, of course. Uh, the underground metropolises were originally created by the United governments and function primarily as fallout shelters, but they do a lot more than just that. Uh, they were all in various different uh, stages of completion when the reset occurred. And as people continued to funnel into them during the apocalypse, uh, many of them, you know, contact was lost with some of them. Not all of them managed to make it. Uh, the United Governments themselves is kind of like this big entity that controlled pretty much everything. Uh, but rather than think of it as a single nation or a single government that controlled everything, they basically represented the largest majority of people, and they had the resources to suppress anyone who opposed them. And so when they moved into these facilities, it's always very totalitarian. It's still kind of representative of a democratic society, but because of the way that they have everyone under their thumb, no one can really oppose them in any kind of serious capacity. So these big underground metropolises are very strictly controlled, you know, population and the growth rate is strictly controlled. The expansion that they have is based on a lot of factors, uh, one of which is resources, because obviously they have very finite limitations on how many buildings they can construct and how much space they have to build in. Right. Even though the bunkers themselves were built in you know, natural abscesses and cave networks that made it easy for them to expand, there's still a pretty heavy limitation on what they can do. There's no useless bodies. Everyone's got a purpose, and... Uh, Although they have some say in what they kind of do in this society, all of the jobs are based on availability and need. And they're kind of segregated into these four different uh, social roles where they fall under military, uh, economic, where they're growing crops or doing some kind of scientific research and uh, the social governing sort of bureaucratic body. Gotcha. So it almost has like a little 1984 vibe to it, it sounds, uh, yeah, as definitely. far as the politics goes. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's really cool. Very interesting. Um, and post-apocalyptic games right now are incredibly popular. I mean, you're seeing so many games come out every year um, that, has, that takes place in some sort of post-apocalyptic world, whether it be zombies, nuclear war, or we just don't know what happened. Um, and uh, it looks like you take a lot of inspiration from games like Fallout and Dead Space um, and uh, from the looks of it, definitely movies like Alien and The Thing, um, which are two of my favorite movies, by the way. So this is really exciting for me because I, I would love to see a game in that kind of uh, uh, in that kind of mindset or that kind of way. Um, so what is Black Cloud Studios doing to to make um, After Reset stand out from other After Earth as we know it games? Well, there's a saying, there's nothing new under the sun, but I think the main differences lie in our general perspective of the game world. We've got a solid grounding for this game that focuses on realism, and even though we've got some things like aliens or some fantasy concepts that have been translated into a science fiction universe, it's still all grounded very firmly in plausibility. And I think that a lot of franchises lose touch with it at some point for the sake of trying to be original. Almost makes uh, we games won't... scarier, I mean, yeah. if it's uh, based in realism. Yes, definitely. Uh, we won't be using any abstract or stylized visions of the future, um, even though I'm a big fan of Fallout and I love their 1950s pseudo-technology vibe that they have going. It works well for their sitting, but it's just not what we have in mind for a game like After Reset. Gotcha. Well, that, the, that's, it's going to be a really cool game. Um, just having looked at some of the artwork on, on your site, I can't wait to, to see it in action and uh, on my computer screen. Um, now, speaking of Fallout, you guys boast a bigger world than that of uh, Fallout 1 and 2 combined. 
Uh, so what, what kind of things can we expect to see in this world, and uh, what kind of people live here? Well, the main thing that we're trying to achieve is a balance between the open-world game design of games like Fallout and the extremely intimate and claustrophobic situations that you get out of games like Dead Space or Deus Ex, where the worlds are all very heavily theory-crafted. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result of that, we've got tons of different factions, and you're going to be encountering them in different ways depending on which kind of situation you're in. You'll be free to explore the wastelands and the deserts limited only by natural barriers like radiation, terrain, things like that. So there is still a little bit of level design there, but for the most part, we're trying to keep it as open-ended as possible. As for the factions themselves, there's going to be things like the emerging new confederacy, which is a band of survivors that under the threat of the emerging United governments as they come out of their underground bunkers for the first time in hundreds of years, these bands of survivors are going to have to band together in order to fight them, and that's where the Confederacy comes from. Then other factions like the Indian Alliance represent kind of a opposition to that in that they're sort of the old, old world, even before like the creation of the United States and the discovery of America, you know, there were Indian tribes that were there. And some of them have still managed to survive throughout all of history and throughout all of the reset and everything else that's taken into account. And that has some things to do with how we're using aliens in this story. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to get into that just yet. And aside from them, uh, we've got, of course, raiders and your everyday villains that you're going to find in small isolated locations there's Those gonna be every, prophets. everyday jerks that, that you yes. just have to run into yeah basically they're people who value their freedom in the same way that uh you know pirates did in the caribbean yeah. and they they're just out to make it for themselves and they don't care about the united governments they don't care about the confederacy they're just out to make them the best of survival for the situation that they've gotten they don't want to answer to anybody so even in the, in the face of their annihilation from the emergence of the united governments who has all the technology of the old world and has managed to survive in a much better situation than everyone else, they just don't care. And so you'll find all different kinds of types of people in this world. And some you'll be able to make your friends. A lot will be, by default, your enemy. And throughout all of it, you'll be able to make uh, connections that are going to be very realistic. You know, Rather than have it be a simple alignment system, all of these factions are going to respond well to people who think like they do more than they do some kind of abstract preconception of whether you're good or evil. Oh, that's, uh, I, I like the sound of that. Um, definitely any kind of choices or anything like that where it, it makes it more about the survival than about what's right and wrong, I, I'm, I'm a that's fan right. of. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what kind of gameplay can we expect from After Reset. Obviously, you've mentioned uh, it's an RPG, and um, the gameplay trailer that you have on your, uh, you guys' website, uh, afterreset.com, uh, it kind of looks like a top-down, and some of the screenshots look like there are some over-the-shoulder th uh, third-person elements, but I want to I get an idea of uh, what kind of gameplay we can expect. Well, we've definitely taken a lot of clues from Fallout Van Buren, and... Oh, uh, like one. you said, it's going to be a top-down 3D RPG, uh, very similar to the games like Neverwinter Nights or the classic Fallouts. Uh, but the inclusion of 3D will give you some control over the camera. And so if you want to, you will be able to do a little bit of the over-the-shoulder action. And uh, it's you know entirely subjective as to kind of which you prefer. However, the top-down camera will be the default setting and will probably be the only option for the Steam Early Access. But we, we do have some ideas on how we can do more with that. Uh, it's really just a technolo technological limitation as to whether or not the over-the-shoulder thing is uh, going to be workable as kind of uh, kind of like a default uh, option. Gotcha. I I do like the the look of the the top down. I mean, it really gives you that opportunity to to really appreciate the world that you guys are building, and it looks like you you guys are taking a lot of time in uh, in creating that environment and. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see how much of a character just the the world that the game is set in becomes, um, because it, it looks it looks beautiful so far. Yeah, absolutely. And our goal is to keep it fluid, keep all the action in real time, so that the amount of time that you have to make critical decisions and your you know your reaction speed 
to uh, situations that you see developing is going to be a big factor in the gameplay. And I think that's pretty difficult from an over-the-shoulder camera. So most people will probably find the top-down view the way to go. Absolutely. Um, now, currently on Kickstarter, you guys are trying to get back, uh, backers for a prequel graphic novel to the game. Um, what inspired you guys to go the route of graphic novel for, uh, for a prequel or to even have a prequel, uh, you know, uh, Kickstarter. Right. Well, we were looking at um, a number of options that we had when our initial Kickstarter for the game did not fund. Uh, we still managed to get a decent amount of exposure for it, and that allowed us to get some direct backers. It allowed us to get some support for it, and that's been keeping us going for the time being. But we wanted to set some smaller, more achievable goals for ourselves so that we could have something that we'd release as a studio and be able to show, you know, see, we can do it. We can meet what we're promising and uh, so we had to come up with some kind of uh smaller project or and really it's actually a series of smaller projects and the other parts of it we just haven't announced yet Ooh. but the fall of guys was originally planned to be something of a mini game which we were thinking of as something in between a downloadable content for a full-fledged game or a separate game by itself that uh worked in an episodic nature kind of the same way that walking uh telltale's walking dead series does uh-huh um but we weren't able to get the funding for that so we had to downsize the project even more and personally i think a graphic novel is a better medium to tell the story anyway and i think it will still allow us to establish that successful track record that we're, tr we're striving to achieve uh, while we continue to work on the bigger projects like the after reset main game absolutely and uh, listeners of the ridiculous rants podcast know how addicted i am to graphic novels and comic books in general um so you just so you know, as soon as I saw this and the the artwork and some of the the names behind it, I immediately uh, jumped in on that uh, twenty five dollar pledge, just because it it's beautiful. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, it's fantastic. Adam's got some great work. He's worked on a lot of big projects. I'm very excited to be working with him. Yeah, and uh, you're you're a writer in it, correct? Yes, I'm the one who's going to be writing the script for the graphic novel. And uh, although I don't have as impressive list of credentials as Adam does, uh, I'm a BFA graduate with a, uh, excuse me, a BFA in creative writing from Full Sail University. Oh, wow. and I've been hey, working. you're an Orlando man. Yeah. That's awesome. And I've been working with After Reset and uh, Black Cloud Studios for about four or five months now. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to delve into as much of the game story as I'd like to, but we're getting there, you know, as our level of funding allows. Well, good. Um... And uh, how, can, how can listeners get in on the comic? And, uh, yeah, let's start with there. How can listeners get in on the comic? Uh, well, we're very open to suggestions, and the best way to communicate any ideas that you might have with us is through our forums. Uh, as far as offers and pledges go for the Kickstarter, you know, I'm pretty, uh, I suppose, biased towards the packaged game plus novel deal since I think that gives you a pretty good bang for your buck at $40. Uh, but, it, you know, it's all subjective. It kind of depends what people want. If you just want the novel, uh, we'll be happy to, you know, to just do that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, you guys are about halfway through your, uh, the, the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like you've got about half of, half of your goal pledged. Um, so it, I'm really hoping that you guys uh, get up on this and uh, I'll make sure to to get as many people as I can on board with it as well. Um, because, again, uh, this, this looks like a game I could really get behind. I, I don't play PC games often, but, but when I do, uh, I, I have a hard time putting them down. Yeah. Well, I definitely understand where you're coming from, and we're going to do everything within our power to make this game everything that we're promising it to be. I know in working with Richard Nixon, he's got some pretty high standards when it comes to both the, the preconception of what the game is going to be, how we're going to develop it, and we're making some pretty impressive progress on the prologue chapter considering how difficult it's been for us to get to this point. And uh, we're just pretty much going to have to wait and see what happens. Gotcha. Well, uh, I wish you guys the best of luck. Uh, lastly, uh, when do you guys have a time frame on when you think fans can, can see this game? Yeah, uh, primarily what we're working on right now is the prologue chapter. Uh, we've already been greenlit on Steam, and we've got a store page set up where you can see all of our products and our current funding level for what we're developing. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, 
develop our website to make it the most communicative and uh, you know transparent as possible as to where the money is going and what we're developing. As far as the release itself for the Steam Early Access, it's going to be mid-summer. We don't have a hard date on exactly when that's going to be, but my bet is that it's going to be uh, the end of July. And uh, how, how can uh, listeners get in on the Early Access? Uh, directly through our store page. Unfortunately, the Kickstarter that we have for the game and graphic novel un- cannot include the Steam Early Access because there's a competition of terms of service between Kickstarter and Steam. So unfortunately, we can only do the Steam Early Access for direct pledges. But we will be able to get an alpha of the game out fairly shortly after Steam Early Access. So it's not really going to be a big deal. It's probably going to be a couple weeks or maybe a month at most. Gotcha. Well, that's, uh, that's very exciting. And one last, one last question. Other than mm-hmm. PC, are there any plans to potentially send this to consoles or any kind of handheld device or anything along those lines? Uh, right now, that falls completely under technology and the level of funding that we have. If our Steam early access goes really well, it's certainly possible. I wouldn't rule it out. But I don't think that it's very likely that we're going to be expanding outside of the PC, Mac, and Linux market. Uh, Consoles use a completely different architecture and require a lot of extra programming time to make those ports. And plus, usually, in my experience, ports are never as satisfying on a competing hardware than what they're originally designed for. So while it's still a possibility, it all depends on how well uh, the series of projects that we have that are going to be released uh, do in the next 12 months. If each one of them funds in a successive uh, series, then we'll be able to do some extra things that we hadn't originally planned. But right now, as long as our funding remains tight, we're going to keep it pretty limited to PC. Gotcha. All righty. Well, Jeremy, I want to thank you very much again for uh, sitting down and having this chat with me. Um, where uh, Where can everyone find the latest information on After Reset? Uh, well, we keep everybody updated on both of our Kickstarter projects as well as on the main page of afterreset.com. Uh, so it just depends on what your preference is. If you like email updates, the best way is to back us for a dollar or more on any of our Kickstarters, and we always keep those updated whether or not they fund or not. Gotcha. Well, and I'll put uh, the links for those places in uh, in the description and in the blog so you guys can all go find out how to support Um, Black Cloud Studios and uh, learn more about After Reset. Um, Thank you again, Jeremy. Absolutely. uh, Thank you. Remember, everyone, you can't spell ridiculous without Riddick.